um, and then at that point, you can also mute yourself. So um, if you don't mind staying muted, if you're not talking, that just helps the background noise, but everybody has now been unmuted and should be able to jump in or mute yourselves. Hopefully you're seeing my PowerPoint screen here. Let me know if you are not. And um, if you wanna use that chat pod to introduce yourself and where you work, um, if you have any, um, specific questions or you know what you do feel free to introduce yourself if you haven't had the chance to do so before and just about other quick housekeeping um there's your mute and unmute if you haven't found it already here's where you can find the chat pod at the bottom of your screen if you haven't seen that there's a raise your hand option but again we're pretty informal so um don't worry too much about that i think everybody has a screen name we can read so we're good with this slide um, and I want to just take a minute and thank Paul Albritton from the LTAP in Iowa. Paul provided a lot of this information um, for today's presentation, which was a great way to get us started. Um, we have a really great full day hands-on workshop training that Brent Beebe does with us, but um, until we can be back out in the field for this, I was really pleased and thankful for Paul um, providing this for Scott and I to, to work from for this one hour. So um, thank you to Paul and his team. And with that, Scott, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you. You bet. Thanks, everybody, for uh, attending this morning here. And uh, we're going to kind of crank through a few of these slides here, but just want to hit some highlights here relative to chainsaw safety. First of all, I'll give a disclaimer. I'm not a, I'm not a pro uh, handler of chainsaws. I'm a um, homeowner and uh, run a chainsaw for years and got into public works and learned a heck of a lot more and things that I were, wasn't doing uh, properly. So certainly um, take a few of these little tidbits of information and uh, hopefully you can apply it in, uh, in your public works field as well as at home. I uh, certainly changed all my bad habits that I had at home. And a lot of those were all surrounding, uh, certainly, uh, you know, every, it seems like every homeowner has a chainsaw. Um, but there's about 28,000 injuries that occur every year, um, and most, uh, most of those are uh, injuries to um, the feet, legs, um, lower torso. Um, there's only about 10% that are actually an upper torso. Um, I will tell a, a gory story here as we get going, but uh, I did 24 years in law enforcement. One of my worst uh, chainsaw accidents that I ever saw was when I was a police chief. I had a fellow who um, I actually... Uh, I actually knew, unfortunately, that uh, was a tree cutter. He had climbed the tree, uh, was, uh, was his spikes, and uh, was uh, tied off and was cutting a tree and had a kickback. And uh, he did not have um, upper chest um, protection and or neck protection. And unfortunately, had a kickback and took him in the carotid artery. And uh, he bled to death, unfortunately, at, on, on the tree uh, before we could get him, get a crane there to get him down. So, um, you know, things happen. And uh, I, I actually got to see, see that, that happen. And it was a bad situation. I've also seen another uh, chainsaw accident, which um, involved a, another gentleman in town uh, that I was working in. I had a kickback. He was cutting slash and kickback. It hit him in the actual in the face. And uh, he's got a pretty permanent scar now, unfortunately. He was very fortunate that he didn't uh, do any real serious damage other than uh, more cosmetic and then uh, had to fight a lot of infection uh, from that. So uh, certainly, um, you know, it, safety is is a key key thing here in operating a chainsaw. Um, and in public works, you all know we all have to do that. So we'll go on to the next slide here. And all right. So um, our objectives are to basically um, because Brett does a um, a full day of chainsaw training, we wanted to bring a little bit of orientation and, and uh, Marilee and I and Butch all talked about that there's a couple different ways that we can do this. And, and I mentioned that if we can get some of these basics under, under control, it may free up some more classroom time for more practical applications uh, for folks. So some people have a general knowledge of the saws themselves. So we're gonna talk about general safety precautions, uh, personal protective equipment, cutting equipment, uh, fuel handling, and then saw operation and cutting. Uh, and some maintenance of the SAR itself. So uh, we'll touch on all these areas here as, as we go along. So um, the more you know about your SAR, the better, certainly. And even myself as a homeowner, uh, in buying my first chainsaw, I think back you know, over the years, I didn't know everything that that SAR did. Uh, so it was, it was actually good to know that. Get, get to know the nomenclature of the SAR itself. 
um, and uh, know what size saw that you have uh, to do the job. You know, a lot of people buy a small saw and they, uh, they tackle big projects and um, they can get themselves into trouble that way as well. Um, and sometimes they can have a more powerful saw and a larger bar on it and uh, be doing some small operations with it and can have some serious problems as well. Um, and as everybody always says, make sure you check your owner's manual um, so you know what the uh, limitations or uh, what the saw can do. So the main parts of the saw, certainly just going over quickly on the nomenclature of the saw itself, as far as the components, um, knowing where your air filter is, this uh, schematic here gives a pretty good um, location of those. Of course, you'll have to deal with some of these things with maintenance uh, relative to the air filter, um, your quick tensioner, uh, which is number three there, um, and also your uh, bumper spike, uh, chain sprockets, uh, knowing where these items are, and being able to keep them clean and uh, debris, uh, debris clear uh, eventually uh, going through it. Um, you know, you'll end up having to, uh, you know, your bar, uh, we'll talk a little bit about bar maintenance uh, in the in the farther along here, um, and then the, uh, the saw chain itself and how that actually uh, travels. So the other main part of the saw itself, um, of course, the main component is, uh, is your is your actual chain brake uh, or front handle guard, um, your front handle, where your spark plugs located, uh, throttle trigger, and, and uh, those types of items, along with your choke and um, choke lever itself, fuel cap, uh, and muffler, uh, and also your uh, oil fill cap uh, and bump spikes are also located on on this side here. You can actually see those fairly well. Your combination spanner wrench will be referred to quite a bit uh, during the presentation. Uh, that is, uh, as I call it, the multi-tool of chainsaws. Everybody should have one. Generally, it's in your back pocket along with a, along with a wedge. Um, you seem to always have a, have your tool there for either tensioning, tightening, and uh, taking your bar and loosening it up. Uh, it has the um, wrenches on there and, and also the screwdriver tip. Uh, and then their bar guard, as far as uh, transporting a saw and being able to chain, have a slide guard over your chain to protect the chain. So um, general safety precautions. Um, once again, as I mentioned earlier, definitely a, a dangerous tool uh, here, a lot of power. Um, that chain is, is pretty destructive. Um, and always uh, use common sense. Um, I think that a lot of people, um, having good common sense certainly will have good success in operating a chainsaw um, that way. And uh, if you're unsure or you're beyond your capability, ask. Um, I've learned an awful lot, as I'm sure many of you have, from others. And um, some things um, I've seen others do um, that were a little bit scary. Um, and certainly those are the types of things when this comes down to safety that you need to make sure that you, you call those um, situations out. So general safety precautions, um, certainly we want to make sure that it's uh, safe use includes all three of these, uh, the operator of the saw and the use of the saw as we go through. And our personal protective equipment is, is essential. I think about myself as a homeowner, you know, I was a police chief and a police officer, a firefighter, and uh, the only time, um, you know, I mean, I had helped the highway guys, you know, moving stuff out of the road when I was a police officer and those types of things and at home. I didn't, I didn't use a pair of chaps. Um, you know, I wore a pair of steel toe boots and I uh, might've worn hair, hearing protection, but I wasn't in gloves, of course, but I, I didn't wear chaps and those types of things as a homeowner. These are critical components to have an approved helmet, um, hearing protection, uh, goggles or some form of visor to keep chips out of your eyes, gloves, um, the chaps themselves of saw protection uh, pants, um, and then boots, uh, steel toe uh, recommended or composite um, in that situation. The other thing to be conscientious and aware of is those helmets uh, do expire. Uh, there's a tag inside and uh, you should review that periodically. I want to say it has, my recollection was, I think it's about a five, it might be a five year uh, lifespan window on those. So you, you might want to check that. There is a tag in the inside um, that will tell you on that. So. Okay, um, and once again, that, that equipment should be approved and you should inspect it. Um, you know, many of these safety classes, as Butch has always said, 
Uh, safety's first, of course, and we want to make sure we inspect the equipment that we have um, out there. Certainly a hard hat is there for any falling limbs or anything that uh, might come down that, um, that way. And certainly it is a uh, safety component. Um, it has a absorption net inside to uh, absorb that inertia energy as if in fact something should happen to come down on you and help prevent concussions or fractures of your skull. Once again, it needs to meet that ANSI um, Z89.1, which is a tag inside. The uh, eye protection, uh, whether people are wearing safety uh, glasses or goggles, I see a lot of guys that actually are in the tree business that wear goggles. Um, and uh, once again, uh, there is an ANSI standard for those as well, um, you know, for uh, those, those type of protections. A lot of folks um, will wear the actual screen visors along with their regular eye protection, standard eye protection. Uh, hearing protection, once again, um, need, that needs to be approved as well and um, should be worn at all times. As you know, many of the uh, helmets that are out there have built in um, earmuffs that are attached. Uh, that seems to work probably the best for a lot of a lot of applications. I know the tree climbers they they not ne they don't necessarily do that. Uh, tree climbers generally will wear a, a different kind of a, a helmet itself and uh, goggles and then uh, the hearing protection so, uh, that way. Um, the hearing protection once again this is the different dec decimal levels that are um, there uh, with chainsaws. You know, running chainsaw is, uh, has a you know 110 dB uh, decimal gain there. Um, and these these really do help out tremendously. I can tell you that my hearing has definitely um, paid over the years between running a firearm and then now running equipment. And uh, I came to certainly quickly learn to wear my hearing protection so I didn't make it any, any worse than what it is. Um, and the recommendation, once again, um, as you saw that pop up there um, relative to the uh, hearing protection is that you need to have that um, you don't want to be, have that situation of being unprotected. Uh, gloves, non-slip, um, snug fitting uh, seems to work the best, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, you think about the different gloves that we've had over the years, but if you have something that has some form of an elastic-y type of band uh, to keep the, the glove um, secure to your hand itself versus a, a large open cuff um, Glove doesn't seem to work as well. That and you're getting shavings and, and wood chips in the in the gloves. Um, the other thing is you don't you don't want to have something that's loose. It's going to snag uh, and get caught up. Uh, and it works well for uh, helping out with the anti um, vibration as well. Um, once again, those warnings. Um, you know the PPE uh, cannot eliminate the risk of in injury, but will reduce the degree of the injury. Um, and needless to say, a number of people have told me those chaps, man, have those saved them um, many a times. And uh, here we are right here looking at the chaps themselves. And uh, in the statistics, they have four out of 10 injuries to the leg. As I mentioned, that's where the majority of those injuries end up occurring. And, um, you know, wearing those cut resistant uh, chaps and, and they extend over the boots um, is, is critical, really. You think about the time in which you have that saw and, and um, you know, I've seen a lot of different applications where you get a saw that wasn't running correctly and it's running rough and it's in the high idle, uh, that chain's still moving, uh, which is an unsafe situation. Um, and if you're not aware of it, um, it can be pretty, uh, have a great impact on you. Uh, once again, the, the boots, non-skid, um, and if you can uh, certainly have in that, that, um, that toe there that is uh, a steel toe, to prevent any injury. The operator itself uh, needs to certainly be of uh, good condition, uh, good vision. Um, have your head in the game. If your head's not in the game for the day, probably better to hand the saw off to somebody else. You know, if you've had a, had a tough night um, as far as um, things at home or uh, haven't been feeling well or didn't get enough rest the night before, uh, don't, be, don't be the proud guy that says, I got this, um, hand the saw off. Um, you'll be, you know, once again, you, you got to have your head in the game. You got to make sure that you're you're on target. You're dealing. You got a you got a lethal weapon there. Um, same things I used to tell police officers. If your head's not in the game, um, good day to stay home. Um, you know you're out there and, and uh, they're dealing with deadly force issues. 
Um, and uh, you've got a, you get quite a weapon here. Um, not that you're using it as a weapon other than on trees and uh, brush, but uh, once again, that's a real serious thing. As I mentioned, the fatigue and certainly um, people are, you know, not <laughs> drugs and alcohol. It certainly doesn't mix with the, with the chainsaw. Uh, I've arrested people with uh, chainsaws and uh, with alcohol, but they weren't cutting trees. Um, other considerations, of course, are uh, sunscreen, uh, making sure that you have a safety plan as far as a cell phone, first aid kit, um, you know, uh, work in pairs, certainly. I know most departments uh, have a call out situation. If, in fact, somebody gets called out for a tree, uh, they go out in pairs. I know uh, other communities, uh, sometimes a police officer can stay on the scene, so the call out person can be there with, with another person. But uh, you, I know when I was a road agent, um, if I didn't have somebody that could go out with me, I mean, I've had my, to be honest with you, I've had my wife, I've had, uh, I've got two daughters, um, you know, they've come out with me. Um, so I had somebody, a second person there. Um, so if I did have to use a saw, so, um, you know, certainly uh, works pretty well. All right, we'll move on here. And once again, the first aid training is a good, definitely a good thing to have in making sure that you have a first aid kit. Um, so the machine safety equipment, we'll kind of go over uh, those components here now. And with the machine safety equipment is, let's see, okay. But so, I want to pass that, what's that? I want to pass that last warning really quickly. So I don't know if anyone saw that, but using the chainsaw is tiring. So make sure oh. you're taking breaks as you need to. I bumped through that one too fast. Oh yeah. No, it definitely is tiring. I mean, everybody knows uh, if you've run a chainsaw already, it is it is probably one of the more you know uh, strenuous um, type jobs. It's a it's definitely a manual labor job, even though it's a it's a power tool and it's helping you out in uh, in your work. It is certainly very very strenuous. And uh, once again, being of good health is a good situation. And when you become fatigued, to hand the saw off and, uh, and let somebody else take over and. Uh, because if you get too tired and you stumble and fall, that's going to be a bad situation. Um, or you can't keep a good firm grip on your machine. So um, chain break in the front front guide, we talked about that. We went over the nomenclature, which is uh, up just ahead of the handle, um, critical component for the machine. Uh, that way for safety, uh, your throttle lockout, uh, which is on your, on your handle and your trigger, uh, does not allow the... Uh, machine to throttle up without um, having your hand firmly on the on the handle itself. Uh, your chain catcher, um, the chain catcher itself is a component that um, if the chain should happen to break, um, that it actually catches the chain and uh, balls it up so it doesn't um, come out and um, hopefully hit you uh, that way. And the anti-vibration handle is a nice feature, and especially with the fatigue of doing, running the machine. So the chain brake itself uh, is activated manually uh, or automatically. Uh, if you have a kickback situation, um, it will automatically, um, you know, uh, initiate the actual chain brake itself, or you can uh, manually be able to lock that in. Um, you know, we'll do, I, we'll be covering here about starting machines and, and uh, that situation is that you apply that manually um, to the front guard as far as pushing it forward. Uh, this helps reduce uh, the injury of the kickback, as I mentioned, and it also um, is uh, a safety feature relative to starting the machine itself. Um, once they're done, there it is, right there, where the chain brake must be engaged in starting a machine or the saw. Uh, the throttle lockout um, is that little small uh, tab that's on the upper part of the handle that ensures that you um, are ready to actually initiate the saw and do cutting by putting your hand firmly in the, in the uh, handle itself uh, for grasping that and being able to uh, throttle the machine, the uh, saw up. Okay. So the chain catcher, as I mentioned before, is designed to actually catch that chain if in fact it jumps off the uh, bar. Um, I've had chains break, but I haven't had one actually jump off the bar um, that way, uh, but th that is the purpose for that. Um, it's a it's a sacrificial part, um, and um, we should keep spares of that. I, I can only think, you know, over the years, I've only had one of one situation where that's actually occurred, um, and I don't recall that I ever did have a spare. Um, it was an out of service situation and, and getting back and getting the part. But 
Um, I'm sure guys that cut out all, every day have a spare. Uh, you stop switch as far as being able to shut that off. Some are um, spring loaded, some are, uh, most of them I guess actually are, um, nowadays are, are, are actually a regular toggle, not a toggle, but a slide switch. Um, I haven't seen too many now that are a spring switch. Um, and the anti-vibration system that the SAR actually has, which is a series of, on the handle itself, a series of springs that are there to, to uh, take some of that vibration out of the, out of the operation. Um, and that's your, your chain catcher <clears throat> there on the bottom of the, um, bottom of the saw, right above your, uh, your picks um, that are there. Uh, stop switch is usually identified as red in color, of course. And uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, the series of springs, I think there's uh, three or four uh, springs that are in that handle. Um, that help take that vibration for you. So cutting equipment. Uh, the use of chains um, that are recommended for that make and model, uh, making sure that you have things that meet the specifications for the, for the SAR itself. Um, keeping the, the biggest thing is to be perfectly honest with you that I've seen is uh, making sure that you have good, good sharp uh, chains, uh, adult, adult chains like dealing with a dull knife. You know, you think about when you, uh, probably when you, your father told you about, you know, cutting, cutting at home, you know, if you're doing something there, a sharp knife, or if you were a hunter, um, you know, you don't go out in the woods with a, with a dull knife. Um, and you're more respectful of a sharp instrument versus a, um, a not, non, not so sharp instrument. So keep that in mind. Um, and then uh, maintaining the correct depth gauge um, on your settings as far as on your saw um, that way and also uh, proper tension and uh, you know everything good and lubricated that's a that's a real big feature sharp lubrication um, because that that is just as the warning says it will cause you to, to have a kickback it will cause you to um, you want to talk about fatigue try running a chainsaw that's dull um, you'll you'll beat yourself to death um, you'll be tired um, and counterproductive. Um, sharpening uh, a chain. I can tell you that um, my sharpening skills are not like um, some other folks that are in the trade. I can tell you, um, without using the proper um, uh, jigs and guides, um, uh, you wouldn't want me sharpening your saw. But um, there are many different components out there. Understanding your cutting tooth your uh, depth gauge as far as what that is. Generally, when you get your, when you get your um, chain itself, it gives you these specifications as well. Uh, so that way you make sure that you gauge your, your file, um, if you're hand filing uh, with that to understand what that uh, depth gauge actually needs to be. Um, so filing the angle is critical. And as I mentioned, as um, there's a lot of different jigs out there and uh, gauges uh, that are utilized for this purpose. Um, I, I've seen some pretty talented people that can hand, hand do these and I'm just amazed, um, but they've been doing it a long time and they've, they've probably cut a lot of trees. Uh, but you know, for, for folks that aren't, aren't familiar with them, um, it's really good to um, actually get a gauge uh, that actually works. And being able to maintain that file position I'll never forget being taught how to do that, you know, even from my dad, is that, you know, if in fact you get your, your file tip one way or the other way, it has a, a drastic effect. Um, but being, being able to keep that, um, you know, uh, level as you're going through, it's great to be able to work on a bench or a tailgate or something that's a good flat surface uh, to set up on. And the depth gauge. Um, it's good to have a depth gauge um, to be able to tell you know how your rakers are. If in fact you're, um, if they need to be taken down a bit um, on that, and uh, the depth gauge will help you out um, with that and keeping that uniformity. If not, that, that can cause kickback issues as well. And then the round file diameter that I <coughs> mentioned earlier, <coughs> being able to make sure you get the proper file for the proper size chain. Um, the sharpening of the saw itself and the depth gauge, you know, that, that's all, those are all features of being able to do it and do it right, especially in the field. Um, you know, some people, um, if they're not really up on that, um, you know, bringing a spare chain with you and, and swapping a chain out, 
um, is not a bad situation versus having a, a poorly sharpened saw if you don't know exactly what you're doing. I'll be honest with you, my neighbor and I cut firewood um, every year. We probably cut 20 cores a year. And, um, and I make sure that he's, he's sharpening my saw um, because he's a crackerjack at it. So um, he, he does a great job at it. Um, and it saves me uh, from beating my head against the wall. So if you can identify people that have that talent in your organization, um, that's great. Or you end up having a, some people have a, now a, an actual um, sharpener, uh, grinder. Uh, that it can do it fairly quickly um, and they bring their chains back and do those in mass. So uh, tensioning the chain itself <clears throat> is a critical component uh, to making sure you got a good efficient SAR as well um, in doing that. So you allow the, make sure your chain is cool, um, that way you loosen the uh, bar nut by using that spanner wrench um, and uh, raise the tip of the uh, bar to stretch the chain um, by tightening the, um, the tensioning screw itself. Um, that tensioning screw is on the bar, and as you saw when we looked at the nomenclature there, um, one thing to keep in mind that does get gummed up sometimes, and you could have you can be sometimes fighting against it. Um, it's a good thing that when you do take your bar off and do that kind of maintenance, that you kind of clean that that out. If you got a lot of gummed up um, bar oil that's around there and sawdust, uh, they don't take care of that. Um, and use that spanner wrench to tighten everything back up. Um, what I find is that um, you really do have to tighten the um, those those uh, bar nuts up uh, really tight. And one thing to keep in mind is when you, when you check that tension on, on your bar itself is, in my experience has been that you get to leave a little bit of slack there just before you end up tightening your, 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 um, your bar nuts up because it, when you tighten those bar nuts up, you will get a little bit more tension out of it. So just keep that in mind that you need to have a little bit, make sure it slides freely around the bar. It's good to actually pull it a good full revolution or two around the bar to make sure it is everything's on there and it's on the actual the actual rear um, uh, as, as I call it a gear wheel basically that's pulling the chain um, around the bar <clears throat> um, and as I mentioned as far as the the tensioning uh, methods is is several different ones but as I mentioned there on the side of your saw uh, there is that access port uh, that has a screw in it but you have to make sure that you um, actually loosen up those uh, nuts on your bar to be able to have that happen. Um, and as the warning says, a loose chain is a dangerous chain um, as far as it jumping off the bar um, and could cause a, a serious injury that way. Um, lubricating and cutting equipment. So chain oil, um, there's all kinds of chain oil out there. Um, I know when I get into the business, um, the, the old road agent, uh, he had summer oil, he had winter oil, um, we had multi-use oil. So um, there's no doubt the seasons do have some effect on the different bar oil that you use. Uh, thinner oil is used in the, in the winter time, of course, because of the cold weather. And then a heavier, um, thicker oil is used during the summertime. And then they have a, a year-round um, blend um, that works uh, that way. Um, and then on the next um, item that we end up having is that um, uh, a poor lubrication um, to cutting equipment uh, may cause uh, the chain to snap, uh, which could cause some serious injury. So you got to make sure that you've got a good lubricated chain. Uh, there's a couple different ways to test that to make sure that you have um, chain. Make sure your oil reservoir, of course, is full um, on, your, on your SAR itself. Um, make sure that you're uh, generally every time you end up fueling your saw, you end up uh, uh, adding to your oil um, and adding your oil in. Uh, so that's a that's a good thing to do. And make sure you clean around the cap before you actually um, go ahead and fill that up, so you don't fill it full of sawdust and wood chips and everything else, because uh, that will gum up your um, your line uh, to access uh, down into the um, the bar itself. And then uh, chain, check your chain to see if, in fact, it is actually lubricated by, um, as they show in this picture here, you can aim it to a light colored surface and uh, cycle the saw through and it sh you should actually see uh, the residue of the oil actually spinning off the chain that way. If you don't see that, then you probably have a clogged port. Um, the clogged port is located on the bar itself. Um, and as you can see in this picture here, in the upper right, that port, there 
um, can get plugged um, and that actually a, actually puts that oil into the, the actual rails of the of the saw itself. Um, so sometimes you may have to clean that out and make sure that it is clear on that end. Um, and then checking the uh, lubrication port in the sprocket um, in, at the head of the uh, tip of the saw. Um, checking on the uh, wear of the cutting equipment itself. Um, you want to be look, check, inspecting your chains, make sure you don't have any uh, cracks or serious nicks in the chain itself um, in uh, examining that. If you do end up having that, of course, you want to either uh, swap, the, swap the chain out or you want to, um, you know, shut down and make sure you um, go ahead and try to see if you can sharpen that. Sometimes when you end up having a pretty serious nick in the, in the chain, uh, it may be, you know, maybe uh, more beneficial for you to swap the chain out uh, because it may have a further crack down uh, in it and potentially could come apart in the link. Um, so on the bar itself, uh, a couple things to keep in mind is looking for uh, burrs on the edges of the, of the bar. Uh, grooves that are uh, becoming uh, worn uh, generally end up, at least I know for myself, I end up having to uh, occasionally um, flip my bar uh, or roll it over and, and uh, uh, because what will happen is sometimes depending on how you're cutting or the type of wood that you're actually cutting is that you'll wear one side of the bar uh, and it'll become uneven so it'll be untrue so if you flip it over then it'll, it'll re-true re itself um, that way. So those things to look at and also look at making sure that your tip of the bar itself doesn't have any um, imperfections up there where it's pinching the actual um, sprocket in the tip of the saw. And always wear gloves of course when you're working on your chain. Uh, you can get some pretty nasty uh, cuts from that. <clears throat> um, fuel handling. Um, old saws are um, a two cycle uh, oil mixture ratio uh, that's there. Uh, certainly check your owner's manual for the recommended um, ratios and uh, as far as putting that together. Um, it's good to use a good quality unleaded fuel. Uh, I know I try to buy a higher octane um, type of fuel uh, just because as we know nowadays with the way the fuel fuel is and, and how that lasts. I know in, in, um, in my public works experience we ended up going to the True fuel um, for uh, machines or saws that were, you know, carried in, in uh, trucks, um, and just so we would make sure that you didn't get in that situation where you had some bad fuel and you're out there pulling your guts out trying to trying to stop the the saw itself. So um, something to keep in mind, either that or using a high octane fuel um, that way. Most of the um, two cycle oil all has stabilizer in it nowadays. <clears throat> Once again, as I mentioned, uh, making sure you have the correct ratio of oil uh, versus gasoline. Um, and um, you, know, you want to mix that in a good clean container. Um, a lot of people, you know, it depends on how much you're using a saw and then how much, um, how much fuel you anticipate they're going to use as far as how much they mix up ahead of time. I always recommended using uh, a smaller can versus a, a larger can, easier to handle. Um, as far as refueling, lots of times you end up refueling when your saw is uh, hot. Um, so it's safer to actually be able to utilize a, a smaller can to be able to do that. Uh, they do make a, a couple different sizes that are small, either it's like a gallon and a uh, gallon and a quarter, gallon and a half type of can, or they end up having a, a two gallon, a two and a half gallon can. Seems to work fairly well. Um, not a real great fan of the, of the new. Um, uh, safety tops to them, but um, yeah, you got to work with what you have and uh, make sure that you're safe in, in what you're doing on the fuel. <clears throat> uh, fuel handling, once again, cleaning around the cap, uh, making sure you got to uh, check your tank filter. Um, that way they, they do have a, a tank filter in those. I uh, haven't really run into, personally myself, uh, issues that way. Um, and then, once again, checking your bar and chain oil. Um, every time you fuel. If you get into that routine, then you're, you're in good shape. And then making sure that you, you fuel up safely. Um, never fuel it up when it's running and then, uh, you know, making sure that uh, 
you know, you move away um, before you actually start starting it up from your fuel source, um, just because of the, uh, you know, the explosiveness that could occur as well as highly flammable. Um, transport and storage, um, you know, you don't want to put a hot chainsaw in a toolbox um, that way and making sure that you use your, your uh, transport uh, bar cover. Um, and then any long-term uh, storage, make sure that you look at that aspect of either using a true fuel or uh, we did use some uh, jet fuel or, or um, avgas um, at times when we couldn't get the true fuel um, to be able to make sure we had good fuel in it. If not, lots of times you end up having to dump it out and, and uh, potentially having to clean the uh, carbs on these because they'll gum out. Um, before starting your, your uh, saw, um, you're going to make sure the chain break is, is functional. Um, you're going to make sure all these components are uh, attached. Um, they're clean and free of oil. Um, there's no um, separation or broken uh, anti-vibration uh, locations. Every once in a while, those, those uh, uh, screw or the bolt that's in there, um, if in fact it hasn't been um, put on properly, if it was worked on at the shop, uh, you want to check that and make sure those haven't backed out if they didn't put the uh, locking nut on it. Um, making sure you've got your mufflers secure and attached as well and all other parts are all in place. Two recommended um, methods for starting and stopping a saw. Um, a chainsaw is started on the ground uh, or between your knees. Um, and uh, on the ground situation is that you're going to place it on the ground, firmly on the ground, um, left hand on the um, uh, grip or the front hand handlebar of the saw itself and uh, put your toe uh, of your right foot into your uh, rear handle in order to be able to start the saw or starting it between your legs um, by um, the left grip um, on the handlebar and uh, lock that in um, with your rear of the saw just above your knee uh, being able to start that and here is here is two different um, diagrams of how to how to safely do that. The idea is in this situation is not to freehand start them. Um, I think probably that's probably one of the biggest things that I see uh, that occurs is that you know freehand starting. Uh, you know I think uh, unfortunately um, we've all done that more times than we wish to probably admit um, in, in starting a saw, but safety wise. Um, and once again, safety first is to do it um, properly and to keep it secure uh, so that when you do start it, um, it, is, it is in a secure situation that you don't have it flopping around on you in that situation. So um, chain brake should be activated when the saw is started and uh, maintain good footing and balance. Uh, make sure you're on good, good firm ground um, that way and then uh, pull a cord till resistance um, so that she fires up and then uh, uh, pull the front uh, guard back to disengage the, the brake. So once you, you know, depending on how, you, if you have to choke the saw, generally every time first start, you got to choke the saw anyways. Um, and lots of times you fire once and then you can go ahead and dump the choke off depending on your saw and the age of your saw. And then you can go ahead and, and uh, do your second pull. And if everything's going good with your saw, you're going to have a saw that started and you can release your brake at that point um, and be able to cycle a chain. Now uh, the stop switch, uh, once again, knowing where that is and uh, where that's located in case you get to make a, uh, shut that off. Um, so they talk about different bar sizes here. Um, I'd have to say that the majority of the bar sizes that we generally see are the uh, a medium um, size saw, um, which is in that 14 to 20 inch uh, bar length, um, which will handle a 12 to 18 inch diameter. Uh, tree, uh, but you know, you see a lot of in uh, Home Depot and the small homeowner saws that are out there, um, the 8 to 12 inch bar, it's just for doing small stuff. Uh, people use those for limb, limbing, um, bucket operations, lots of times. Uh, we had a small, um, little small saw that we used to use in uh, some of our bucket uh, operations as far as some of our limbing, if we weren't using a large pole saw. 
for that. And then, of course, if you're, if you're running some big wood, um, then you're going to need something that's a, a 20 inch um, bar or greater. Um, but commonly, I see you know a lot of between 16 and 20 inch bars uh, that are out there. Um, on the cutting instructions themselves, um, uh, the basic rules of, of cutting is once again under, know your surroundings and look around uh, to make sure that um, you, know, you know where people are, you know where objects are, houses, vehicles, um, those types of things. Um, and you know you don't want something that's going to interfere with your your saw operation itself. Um, as they say, don't use a saw in bad weather. Um, that's a, unfortunately in public works that would be a tough one. Um, I think um, most of our operations, with the exception of doing regular roadside uh, maintenance, is uh, done in bad weather. You think about the windstorms, snowstorms, the hurricanes, and everything else. It's um, we're in those uh, bad conditions. Uh, that's why the safety is critically important uh, that way. Um, and then, uh, as far as taking care of uh, moving small branches, um, you know, and uh, you know, we don't want to be grabbing. Being, having those get grabbed by the chain and, and then, uh, throw back the operator as far as on a kickback. So cutting instructions as far as some basic uh, rules is to make sure that um, you can move and safe and uh, stand safely. So one thing that I was always taught is no way, uh, you know, if you were cutting a tree uh, from, a, from a standing location, certainly no way, uh, you know, route of safety and, and uh, corridor of safety is um, that way and make sure that it's not it doesn't have any obstacles. You know, you don't have to hurdle over a rock, or you don't have to jump over on a log, or um, those types of things. And if you're on sloping ground, uh, certainly you need to make sure that you understand how you're going to traverse that that ground uh, to maintain your stability. Um, in fact, you have a, a situation. Um, and then you need to take great care when you're cutting the tree that's under tension. Um, and that's where you know it's critically important doing this this. Um, this program on a hands-on um, situation where you are um, cutting and if something is under tension um, and being able to um, do that properly so it does not come back. I think back on the on the ice storm <clears throat> which was actually the ice storm in 98 I believe um, at the time I was living in Ossipi and we, we got hit pretty hard we had a lot of sprung uh, trees over that way, and I was on the uh, fire department there in, in Ossipi, and you know we were cutting a lot of stuff that was was pinned down, and um, um, I'll never forget how I learned that I had done a bad cut when uh, next thing I know that that sprung grappling was coming up and and taking my helmet off my head and uh, laying open a, a little gash above my eye, and I was going, wow, I'm glad that didn't take my head off. Um, so those types of things is understanding um, what the behavior and what the what where that force is going to go, um, so you know how to make that cut. Um, on the on the basic rules itself, um, you know, never use a saw uh, by holding it with one hand. Um, you need to securely and firmly hold that saw um, because that that thing gets out of control. Um, that way, and you're going you're to have a, you know, once again, it's a deadly weapon um, that's going to be coming at you. Um, but generally, uh, always use it at, at full throttle when cutting. Um, always return uh, to an idle after every cut. Um, you know, full throttle. That's what this, that machine is made for. It's made to cut. Um, so in the in the actual, um, you know, terminology that's used as far as felling, cutting limbing and bucking. I think people are pretty familiar with that, but if you're felling a tree, that's that's in the process of downing uh, an individual um, series of trees, generally from an upright position or, or in a, um, sometimes you end up having a rooted position that could be called the same situation. If you're cutting wood itself, you think about when you're cutting your firewood, once you've got it down off the stump itself, um, lots of times that's cutting. So you're actually cutting through the actual tree itself. And then uh, limbing is taking the brush off the tree from a felled tree, and then bucking it up is is more or less the um, uh, the firewood situation getting into the size that you want. Um, <clears throat> those common uh, reactive forces um, that we talked about: with kickback, um, or pushback, or or pull in. Uh, this um, actually has a diagram here that shows of that kickback situation. 
Um, generally injuries that occur to the upper torso area generally will be a kickback situation. Once again, critically important, face shield head and uh, head protection um, in that. Um, you know, reactive force may occur <coughs> um, at any time. And so you gotta be, you gotta be ready for it. Um, so it, it can happen. Now uh, the kickback itself is generally off the tip of the, um, can occur on the tip of the SAR as well. Um, when you end up having a chain um, tooth uh, at the tip and it catches it and it'll, um, it'll actually kick back at you. So it jumps, jumps the SAR. Uh, the inertia comes straight back at you, um, throws the bar upward, um, and arc towards the uh, operator. And uh, that, once again, is is serious injury. Lots of times you'll get the chain break will activate. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, these things are definitely things to be um, conscientious about uh, during your, you know, your operation. So. Um, low kickback chains, they do make um, a low kickback chain, which actually has this, that type of a, it looks like a little rider, I guess, um, uh, on that. Um, I, get the, I haven't bought any of those, so I, I've just been buying the regular chains. But um, as far as felling or cutting down a tree, um, you know, you want to consider the con conditions that are out there. Um, you need to actually look at the tree and size the tree up. Um, as far as the natural lean of the tree, uh, the loading, as I call it, the loading of the tree, as far as how, how much brush or how many limbs are, you know, maybe in one one side of the tree or the other, um, understanding the surroundings of the trees and as to how you're going to uh, fell that tree and also looking at wind direction and speed. Um, these all have to be considered in, um, in falling a tree, um, knowing all of these features. Um, you always want to uh, maintain the distance, which is at least two and a half um, lengths from the tree. So your second person uh, that's working with you, you know, certainly wants to be in that, be in the clear zone itself and make sure no one else is in the risk zone uh, because you will be deemed as the cutter or the feller of the tree in the risk zone. And also taking uh, those precautions in your vicinities of uh, roads, power lines, utilities, uh, railroads um, that are there. Um, you know, we have to make sure we, we figure that out. And the actual rate um, triangle uh, feature as far as figuring out the height of the tree and the distance of the tree so you can understand how what how big a zone you actually need in following that, that tree itself um, as far as what you'll need for area. Um, always want to make sure you have a little bit more. Um, your escape path mentioned before there, yeah, knowing where you where you're gonna how you're gonna go if in fact the tree doesn't go the way you want it to go, um, and being conscientious of a of a you know uh, I call it a jump off or a kick off of uh, off the stump um, situation if you don't have that if you haven't figured that balance out correctly potentially you can have it have it kick off the stump on you depending on the size of the tree or if in fact you have other obstacles in the in the area as well. Um, so making sure that you can uh, look at that 45 degree angle as far as your escape room um, and getting away from uh, the direction of the falling. So if you know that you've got it set up to fall this way, understanding that you have two 45 degree paths that you would take a look at as far as being able to be able to escape from. So having those escape routes, critically important and clear, um, as clear as possible. Uh, and you never want to stand directly behind the tree uh, they're about to fall because if in fact something changes and it, it's supposed to go this way and the hinge says nope it's going this way uh, you'll be in direct line so generally all cutting operations will end up having a hinge hinge involved so we'll talk a little bit about um, maintenance uh, schedules and uh, maintenance schedules themselves um, as far as here it, it gives you kind of a rundown as to what should be actually looked at um, and understanding the um, clear uh, or clean uh, adjustment and uh, tensioning. These are every every use situations, your oil system, uh, all the hardware on the, on the system itself, the fuel system, uh, chain brake, um, and uh, your uh, actual kickback or nose guard. They, uh, that's an every every day, every operation um, situation. And then um, 
they recommend about every 10 hours to replace or clean. Uh, a lot of people you know, blow out their air filters uh, every 10 hours, uh, lubricating the, the sprocket tip. Um, you know, you end up using a, a fine tip uh, grease gun. You can um, do that with your sprocket tip. And then um, turn your uh, guide bar uh, in that situation and make sure everything's free and, and working there in your fuel system. Um, they talk about every 20 hours and uh, checking the fuel system. Um, maintenance, uh, carburetor idle itself, um, your throttle lockout, your chain catcher, antivirus, antivirus, oh boy, I'm really stuck on the COVID-19, aren't I? Um, and uh, the anti-vibration uh, system, um, those are all really important things, and mufflers as well, and your starting cord to make sure it's, you, you know, Nothing like uh, getting out there and come to find out your starting cord's been frayed for the last, you know, six months and you just haven't had time to change it. And you go out there for that tree down in the middle of the night and, and that, that cord breaks. So those are things to, to uh, in doing some self-inspections uh, to re repair and replace uh, before you end up having a call out. Um, you know, once again, always referring to the manufacturer's uh, maintenance recommendations. So chainsaw safety, uh, the basics. Um, the saw, uh, once again, is, is, is pretty, the most efficient and productive way to, uh, in, in, as far as the power tool goes for that type of in, uh, industry, um, as far as cutting trees. Uh, nobody wants to go back to the old buck saw or, or back to the situation of running an ax and, and chopping down a tree, I don't believe. Um, and uh, it's also one of the most dangerous uses as well. Um, it, you can, you know, certainly uh, it's properly used and safely used. It, it's going to be real efficient, um, and you know, you want to make sure that uh, it's a good working condition, and um, that helps, you know, avoid injury and you're more productive with it. So, I did that pretty rapid fire. I don't know, even know. I didn't look at what time it is, but it's nine twenty-three, and. Um, you know, I kind of think that this this PowerPoint that uh, the folks there in, in Iowa put together, um, a lot of this is helps get some of that basics out of the way, so that when uh, Brett comes back and is able to do on on site classroom, um, that he doesn't have to spend a ton of time refreshing people um, with a lot of these basics of PPE nomenclature, maintenance of saws, um, which I feel like you definitely have to have them as basics that he can actually get into some of the real technical pieces of it, being able to, to um, you know, fall trees, cut trees, deal with snags. You know, I think about my first time that I ended up having a tree that was uprooted and saying, okay, so there's a lot of weight there in that stump. How am I gonna cut this tree? Um, never having been able to, to do one, even in a simulated situation. So um those types of things there if, hopefully if in fact we can in a practical application uh, in the in the technical training be able to um, do those i think will benefit everybody and um, if we're able to save some of this time that we've actually been able to hopefully orientate people to that um, they'll step in and um, feel like they get you know a lot out of the class certainly um, that way so I don't know if anybody has any questions.